Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome you all for this Ayush Katar branch meeting. My name is Venkat, Vice Chair of uh, Ayush Katar branch. Once again, I take this opportunity to welcome everyone for this wonderful meeting of uh, Ayush Katar branch. Today's meeting is going to be something special. You know why? One of the important, uh, the objective of Ayush and Ayush Katar branches is to collaborate with the younger OHS profession and collaborate with the colleges, universities, and the local communities to bring them into the OHS community to develop or promote the OHS into the community. And today we are going to see a presentation uh, from the students. So I'm really excited. I'm sure all of you are really excited to know what is going to be in our today's meeting. There are a few ground rules. Uh, all participants might will be kept on muted condition and uh, you can choose to keep your camera on or off. It is up purely based on uh, your comfort. But if you are switching on your camera, make sure that you are in a comfortable zone. And to have a better experience of the meeting, please view this meeting in the speaker's view so that you can look at the speaker as well as the presentation. And if you have any questions, please write it in the chat room. We have a moderator who will write down your questions and he will be handling up to the end of the presentation. All your questions will be answered by the presenters. We may lock the meeting after 20 minutes and uh, we all uh, HSC professionals, be aware of your surroundings. In case of any emergency at your respective places, please just drop the meeting and follow the emergency protocols at your respective place. And these are the ground rules. Now let's get into the agenda of today's meeting. Well, after these opening remarks, I'll be inviting the speakers and uh, uh, the presentation will go for around uh, 40 to 40 minutes, then we will have a QA and a session. Hopefully, we will be ending the meeting before 7:30. Well, well, now it's a time to invite the speakers for today's evening. As I said earlier, I'm really excited to have them on board. They are students. Ms. Nasha Khadij and uh, Mr. Abdullah Ansari. They are currently in the third year of Occupational Health, Safety and Environment program at the University of Doha for Science and Technology. Both students are very active in their uh, college academics and they are graduates of the OHSC diploma program and they're very active and supporting to the academic tutors and research assistants. Both have successfully acquired a number of NIBOSH qualifications and they're yet, I mean, they're, uh, I'm sure they're ready to take up the challenging uh, once they graduated to take up the challenge as a professionals in the real field and the topic for today is really really interesting for me personally yeah they're going to speak about monitoring changes in the greenhouse gas concentrations for population well-being and health which is implication and the mitigation strategies for 2022 fifa world cup qatar topic sounds really really interesting isn't it yeah now, let me invite with all your virtual round of applause, the speakers for today's so Ms. Nasha Khadij and Mr. Abdullah, sorry, on the screen, please. Thank you Over very to much. you, Nashwa Abdullah. Did that one, yeah. Uh, slide share, right. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome, Mr. Venkat. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, so my name is Abdullah Ansari, and this is my colleague, Nashwa Khatij. And our topic for today is going to be presenting the research that we've conducted in the University of Doha for Science and Technology. The research was focused on monitoring changes in greenhouse gases, specifically carbon dioxide, uh, in regards to population well-being and health, and as well as implications and mitigation strategies that we'll be covering at the latter end of this uh, presentation to have a better FIFA 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Now, before we get into the details, I'd like to go through the outline of this um, presentation. Uh, my colleague Nashra will be talking about the introduction and background here. She'll discuss what greenhouse gases are, as well as their, uh, the major contributing emissions from different sources. 
Then she will move on and talk about specific global events, sporting events to be in specific, like the Rio Olympics, the 2018 and 2014 World Cups, as well as linking CO2 emissions to indoor air quality, as well as the importance of monitoring CO2 levels and the importance of having these levels monitored in terms of occupation health and safety. Once she's done, you'll have me for the rest of the presentation talking about the health impacts, the aim of our research, the methodology where I will discuss the equipment that we use to uh, collect our data, and finally discussing the results of our data that we've analyzed. Moving on, I'll be talking about the mitigation strategies where I will talk about how we as individuals can reduce the effects of CO2 in terms of health, and finally concluding the presentation with future directions. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on the stage to uh, Nashwa to talk about the introduction. Thank you, Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, good evening all. I'm Nashwa Khadid. So I'll be talking about CO2 emissions in the, in the environment. So CO2 is a gas which is exhaled by us and it's always present in the environment. So why is this a concern? So I'll be talking on CO2 emissions and its effects on the environment, but my colleague will be talking about uh, CO2 uh, and its effects on the health. So CO2 is an important greenhouse gas which traps the sun's heat and allows sun rays to pass through, the, uh, pass through and warm the planet. So the primary greenhouse gases are methane, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. So among this, uh, carbon dioxide is the most abundant and it accounts for 76% of the global emissions. So it is persistent on the environment and it, uh, over the residence time is around 10 to 20 years. So in this picture, you could see a surge on uh, CO2 levels from uh, 1975 to 2020, which is 45 years. So this uh, increase of CO2 levels is mainly due to rapid development and industrialization. So now from this data representation by IPCC, which shows four model scenarios, let's see what changes in temperature will be included, uh, will be induced with an increased level of CO2. So from the year 2000 to 2100, uh, there's an increase in temperature. Uh, the temperature is uh, increased, or, and even if we place uh, for carbon neutral world, there will be an increase of around 3.2 degrees Celsius. So uh, yeah. And uh, if we uh, doesn't follow any climate policies, like uh, the Kyoto Protocol and all, there will be an increase of 4.8 degrees Celsius. And if we follow any uh, current policies and all, there will be an increase of 3.7 degrees Celsius, what is, uh, which we are doing now. But uh, our aim is to uh, have a pledge on uh, carbon neutral world. And uh, if we completely cut off the carbon dioxide emissions, there will be an increase of around 2 degrees Celsius. Why is this so? Because uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the carbon dioxide is a persistent gas, so it uh, stays in the environment for around 10 to 20 years. So the impacts from the historical uh, emissions which we made will be there in the environment. So uh, you might be wondering, like, what difference will be there with a the small increase in temperature? So this increase can lead to global warming, which in turn leads to climate change. So this can have various effects on the ecosystem around the world. So there will be rising temperature, which uh, will melt the glaciers, sea level rise, and affect. Uh, it also affects the wildlife, posing a threat to the biodiversity, and uh, it also warms the ocean and ocean acidification, which uh, poses a threat to the marine life and the coral reefs. So now let's see the human activities, which leads to an increase in uh, CO2 levels. So with an increase in population, there's an increased demand for energy and um, accommodation and all. So we have to burn a lot of fossil fuels in order to get energy and in order to get fuel for the uh, cooking and uh, uh, fuel for the transportation and all. And uh, even the deforestation can lead an increase, uh, leads to an increase in CO2 levels. So rapid development and industrial, uh, industrialization, as I mentioned previously, can increase uh, the level of CO2 as we have seen from the 45 years of, uh, uh, 45 years, there's an increase, a huge increase in CO2 levels. So this is why uh, there's an increase in CO2 levels, mainly because of increase in population, there's a high demand of uh, resources and all. So as we have seen the impacts on the environment from the excessive CO2 emissions, now let's talk about the global sporting events and its contribution to increase in CO2. So major sports events have a role in promoting and supporting uh, sustainability. So building uh, stadiums and infrastructure, gathering millions of people from, all, uh, from across all the world, from all corners of the world, accommodating them, feeding them, and transportation will generate a tons of CO2. So the FIFA World Cup in Brazil uh, generated around 2.8 million tons of CO2. And uh, the Brazilian government estimates 
estimated that like 1.4 million tons of CO2 was generated solely from uh, infrastructure. So this pie chart illustrates uh, a percentage of CO2 emissions from FIFA World Cup 2014 in Brazil. So most of the stadiums was from, uh, most of the emissions was from the uh, in-stadium commercial displays and the infrastructure and the customer hospitality. So in this slide, we'll see more global events. Uh, in 2016, Rio Olympics uh, emitted around 4.5 million tons of CO2. And in 2018, FIFA World Cup in Russia generated 2.1 million tons of CO2. So this is a huge amount. It's mainly due to the population density, which accumulates in that area. So as we have seen the contributions of CO2 emissions from the past few global uh, sporting events, now let's talk about Qatar. So why are we focusing on uh, global sporting events and all? So it's because Qatar is going to hold a uh, FIFA World Cup in uh, a few months. So we'll be talking about it. So Qatar is, uh, is the first Middle Eastern country to hold a FIFA World Cup where more than 1 million people uh, are estimated to arrive in Qatar. So let's see Qatar's role in uh, climate mitigation strategy. So an estimated value of 3 million tons of CO2 is estimated uh, is expected to produce from Qatar. So this is a bit high uh, than previous World Cups because of the size of Qatar and, uh, and they're building a new stadium, like seven new stadiums were built and a lot of infrastructure. So millions of fans from across the world will be here in Qatar to witness the major event. This increases the population density per unit area. From just exhaling uh, CO2 from this million people can contribute to huge amount of CO2. So Qatar is a leading player in climate change mitigation strategies. And uh, Qatar has also pledged to make the first carbon neutral World Cup. So I've talked about the effects of CO2 emissions and the environment contribution of CO2 emissions from many global sporting events and Qatar's role in climate mitigation strategy while hosting FIFA World Cup. So now let's talk about CO2 levels in occupational settings and how does the employees get affected uh, with an increase in uh, increased level of CO2. So the average concentration of outdoor CO2 is around 400 to 450 ppm. As we have talked much on CO2 emissions outdoors, let's concentrate now on uh, indoor CO2 levels. So uh, indoor CO2 levels is a concern because we have been spending our 90% of our lives inside. So inside our uh, offices, home, uh, university, and also we, we've been exposed to a lot of indoor air pollutants. And uh, it is more like two to five times more pollutant than the outdoor air pollution. So with an increase in uh, population density in workplaces and with more number of people will be exhaling CO2, with an addition to poor ventilation system, they can, this can contribute to a huge number of CO2 levels. So it can uh, reach up to 2000 ppm. So high risk of uh, CO2 exposure will be uh, to the uh, workers working in confined spaces, uh, industrial uh, workers and office workers who are uh, exposed to a, a large number of workers together and then poor ventilated areas. So based on research, indoor air should be between 400 to 1000 ppm. But according to the ACGIH, uh, TWA for CO2 is 5000 ppm in an eight hour period. So uh, on our research, uh, when we, uh, we found out that symptoms are uh, such as behavioral changes, cognitive skills impairment, and uh, uh, lack of concentration, uh, which can lead to lack of productivity and which can affect the uh, quality of the work, uh, will be observed from an increased concentration of uh, about 1000 ppm. So the health impacts from excessive CO2 will be discussed by my colleague Abdullah. Thank you, Nashwa. So we've gone over uh, the impacts of carbon dioxide. My colleague Nashwa gave a brief introduction of the greenhouse gases, the major contributors to its emission, and the environmental impacts. But we have yet to focus on the health impacts. Now, this is where I come in, and this is what the focus of our research was on. Now, what this image illustrates is basically CO2 retention in the body. What this means is the amount of CO2 that stays in your blood will increase gradually if your exposure to it is for a long period of time. We're just discussing the pH levels here. Now, by definition, your blood pH basically tells you how acidic or basic your blood is, all right? And what this further focuses on is Based on the 7.4 uh, pH level, which is your optimal healthy pH, this ensures that all the metabolic activities that are in your body are carried out effectively without any hindrances. Now, the problem is, though, exposure to CO2 levels. If you were to increase these levels to, let's say, to 1,000 ppm, 1,500, about 2,000 ppm, 
Sure, it takes time, but you have health effects. There are some outcomes that will result. In this case, what we're focusing on is pH levels. The higher the exposure to CO2, the higher the chances for CO2 be, to remain in the body. This is what CO2 retention is, which will then lead to a drop in pH levels. A drop in pH levels will have health effects. Now, a few examples would be depending on whether it's a chronic uh, exposure or an acute ex exposure. If it's acute to a very high levels, which is almost unlikely, but chronic exposures are what we're focused on. So let's say you're exposed to CO2 levels of 1,000 on a day-to-day -day period for a span of 10 to 15 years of your work life, right? This will lead to diseases such as obesity, diabetes, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's. However, if you're exposed to acute levels of CO2, as my colleague mentioned, workers in confined spaces have a higher chance of being exposed to this. This will lead to uh, symptoms such as respiratory problems, sleep disorders, and anxiety. Moving on, I would like to discuss this table. And the information from this table was uh, provided by research was done prior to ours. And the annotations below tell you the contributors to it. Here, we're comparing health outcomes in respect to exposure time, which is either acute, subchronic, or chronic, as well as how long the exposure is for in terms of in, uh, in respect to time, in hours, days, weeks, months, and decades. What I'd like to focus on are three symptoms, which is the cognitive effects, as my colleague mentioned, decision-making, attention deficiency, and behavioral changes. Now, I'd like to emphasize on these four because as occupational health and safety professionals, poor judgments is directly correlated with higher risk. And higher risk is directly correlated with increase in accident rates in the workplace. So this is why we focus on CO2 as our primary gas, because although there have been studies done uh, to control, to monitor the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, but very few studies are done that talk about the health impacts of carbon dioxide, and specifically in indoor settings. Moving on, we are like to discuss the aims of our research. The primary aim was to understand the emissions of CO2 during global events and how these emissions will have an impact on our health. And my colleague discussed how the 2014 World Cup had about 2.7 million tons. We're not talking about kilograms, we're talking about 2.7 million tons of emission of CO2 into the environment. Then moving on, we also, uh, the approach was to measure CO2 levels at different variable sites. And this were the study sites where our study was conducted, our research was conducted. And we used this data to sort of simulate what would happen in real life scenarios, such as the World Cup, which is a few months from now. Moving on, we also modeled the indoor CO2 levels and what factors led to an increase in CO2 levels in the in indoor setting. And finally, we also recommended, uh, we're planning on recommending mitigation strategies so that Qatar can hold a healthy, sustainable, and successful FIFA World Cup. So let's go on to the methodology. So in order to measure CO2 levels, we use a device TSI indoor air quality. Now this is a dual wavelength non-dispersive infrared sensor. Now you can see from the illustration below, that basically explains to you how it works. Now I'm not gonna get into deep physics here. I'll provide a brief explanation of how this instrument actually collects CO2 levels. Now it has a wavelength from 3,900 nanometer to 4,200. What happens here is you have this chamber with two uh, entry and exit points where at one point the gas enters and the other point the gas exits. So once the gas is in, as you can see from the illustration, the IR lamp will send forth a light. And the wavelengths are of different levels, so 3,900 to 4,200 nanometers. So the CO2 molecules will absorb some of them, and the rest of this is absorbed by the optical filter. And to find out the amount of CO2 that we have in the sample, it's basically the difference between the, uh, the amount of light that was emitted by the IR lamp to the amount of light that was absorbed by the detector. Moving on, I'd like to talk about how we modeled our concentration of CO2 levels as a factor and function of time. So we have six different study sites. Now these study sites varied in area. So this is where the population density index, which my colleague mentioned earlier comes into play. What the population density index talks about is how many people are at a given site in a given time in comparison to the area of that uh, place. So each of these sites varied in their area. We took that into note. Then we measured the CO2 levels in a cluster of two hours. So why two hours? Well, to be honest, the idea was to mimic or to simulate real life events. Now, usually your football matches go for about 90 minutes. If you have penalties, give or take, it goes to two hours. That's 120 minutes, yeah? So this is why we had two hour clusters of CO2 concentration measurements. 
Finally, we also measured background CO2 levels. Now, this background CO2 levels, what this concentration tells you is how much CO2 is in this environment at that given point without any intervention. And this was essential for us to conduct plot our anomaly curve, which I will discuss further in uh, my results and discussion. So this takes me to the first graph that we've had. Uh, this is for the CO2 concentration at low dead population density site in specific site one. On the x-axis, as you can see in this graph, you have the time. This was a two hour period from about eight o'clock until 10. And on the y-axis, you have the CO2 concentration. So it's a change in the amount of CO2 in this environment. Now, what do we mean by a low density factor? It means that the area, the population or the number of people in that given area weren't very high or the size of that area was rather big so that CO2 can diffuse easily. Now, as you can see from the graph, the maximum increase that you have here is about 100 to 150 ppm, which means that population density has is a contributing factor to the amount of CO2 in a given place. Now, the next graph tells you about the results we collected from a high density factor. This is from site five. Once again, on the x-axis, you have the time about two hours. And in the y-axis, you have the CO2 concentration. There's a change in uh, the increase in CO2 in, within that two-hour period. Now here it's clearly uh, evident that you have a higher CO2 levels. So back to, again to the point I mentioned earlier, so population density has a contributing factor to the amount of CO2 in a place. In this case, you have an increase of about 800 ppm in the span of two hours only. Now imagine having increasing the time uh, exposure to this and back to the graph that I mentioned, we're talking about the health impacts, which I'll further talk about after the anomaly curve. All right, finally, we have the anomaly curve. What we do in this anomaly plot is basically subtract the values that we get in a high density area with the background readings. So the background readings are usually about 400 to 450 ppm. That's the levels of carbon dioxide in a given place in the study site without any intervention. So on the x-axis here, we have time, this time though in minutes, because the purpose of an anomaly plot is to talk about how much CO2 increases in respect to time. Right, so in five minutes, how much increase do you have in 10, 25, 30 minutes and until the two hour period. And on the Y axis here, instead of just having an increase of CO2 over the two hour period, we're having Delta CO2. Now, let me elaborate on what that Delta stands for. The Delta uh, means a change in CO2 levels. The change we're talking about here is how much of the CO2 is changing from the baseline, which is our background level, up until the level that these, uh, the sum total of CO2 that's in that place. So let me elaborate on this by explaining the graph. So let's say at the 35 minutes, you have a change in CO2 about 400 ppm. That means your sum total, the concentration of CO2 at that point, given point at that 35 minutes in that specific area is 800. That means you had a change of 400 ppm in just 35 minutes. You aren't even talking about hours here. In 35 minutes, you have an increase of 400 ppm of CO2. This means as time went along, when we reached a two hour mark, you had an increase of, of about 800 ppm of CO2, bringing the sum total or the cumulative value of CO2 in that specific area to about 200, 1200 and above for, two, for a two hour period. Now I'd like to refresh remembering and go back and discuss the health impacts. So why exactly the anomaly plot? Well, the anomaly plot helps us indicate rapid increase in CO2 concentration. This is why I mentioned on the x-axis, instead of having a two hour time period, we wanted to find out exactly how fast is the CO2 changing, the rate of change of CO2 in respect to time. And what we found out, yes, it is true, in a high density uh, population or a high density function, you have an increase as high as 1200 ppm. And based on the graph, uh, not just the pH levels, and I, as I mentioned earlier, if the amount of exposure is increased, and the more you're exposed to CO2, it will be it will retain in the blood, meaning it leads to CO2 retention, which will have a direct effect on your pH. Unfortunately, though, it's not just the pH that is affected. You also have cognitive defects. You have cognitive problems. You have poor judgment, lack of attention, behavioral changes, and stress, which is a contributing factor in terms of health and safety to high risk of accidents. With that said and done, I'd like to talk about our. I'd like to discuss about our uh, research using this graph now. I've mentioned a few uh, variables. The first thing was the amount of CO2 that increases with respect to time. And then we talk about the area of the place as well as the number of people in the given place, right? So this is what we get in the x-axis here. It's the population density function. This is a multi-factor graph which compares, which basically plots your population density function versus the rate of CO2 that increases per minute here. We're not talking about the anomaly graph where, we talk, where we're discussing the change in CO2 every five minutes in comparison to your background reading here, 
we're talking about the correlation between population density function and the amount of CO2 that will increase. So as you can see in a 0.04 population density function, which is an area of low population, population density, you have about one to two ppm of carbon dioxide increasing per minute, which isn't very scary, to be honest. However, if that population density function increases, let's say to about 0 0.29, you have an increase to about eight ppm per minute. Now think about having ex being exposed for a two hour period. And what our data showed us, are, it, although it's preliminary, it showed about we can reach the world levels of 1200 ppm of carbon dioxide in a span of two hours. Which brings me to the mitigation strategies. So we've discussed the environmental impacts of CO2. We've discussed global events and how they contribute to these emissions. We also discuss the health impacts of CO2. So what can we as responsible individuals, as responsible occupational health and safety individuals, can, can we do to reduce the health impacts of CO2 in our body? Well, it's quite simple. What we're proposing is installation of health and well-being kiosks and match face. And what this kiosk will provide, it'll provide the spectators, you know, both locals and tourists who are coming in for this event about the ways they can improve their health and well-being. And this can be done simply according to the spy chart by just drinking water. You see, it's the initiative that you have to take that will further reduce the effect of CO2 on every individual. So by just replenishing your uh, with water, you're making sure that your pH is at a neutral level so that all the metabolic activities are carried out effectively. You can also reduce smoking. And it's evident from certain, several researches that uh, smoking increases the con decreases the concentration of oxygen in the body, thus leading to breathlessness. You can also have healthy foods, which are rich in iron and nitrates because they increase the blood supply to vital organs and tissues. And finally, you should reduce consumption of carbonated drinks. In conclusion, the reason why we chose to measure carbon dioxide in specific, as I mentioned earlier, is because the health effects are often neglected. And it is, as my colleague mentioned, it is the most abundant of the greenhouse gases and it is the most persistent. And it is, it has a residual period of what, 10 to 20 years, meaning it will stay with us. It's not a gas that we can talk about. You open the doors open and an indoor uh, area and everything diffuses easily. It's still going to be in the environment. And based on the uh, multi-factor graph that we have, it, which it is evident that population density has direct correlation to the change in CO2 or to the amount of CO2, carbon dioxide that would increase in indoor settings. Why indoor settings? As my colleague mentioned, we, we spend 90% of our lives in here, be it in school. I mean, currently we're meeting at you know, through Zoom. So we're staying in offices, we're staying at our homes, we're currently in the university, although it's late. And it's it's evident that you, we, you will have an increase and you will be exposed to CO2 on a day-to-day -day period. So what? how are we gonna progress with this research? Well, our results are preliminary, so we'll have to develop our uh, graphs and our data. So this would be done by developing the empirical mode, the data that we calculated where we uh, graph the population density versus the increase in CO2 per minute by conducting more uh, experiments, collecting more data, more field data, and then as well as collecting measurements or CO2 measurements during the World Cup to actually check our accuracy levels. Furthermore, we'll have to move into phase two of our research where we'll actually have our volunteers and we'll monitor the changes in their blood pH as they're exposed to level, high levels of CO2. This will be all done in a uh, good environment without any risk to any volunteers. But the idea is to further progress our research and provide enough data so that it can support our uh, hypothesis. Now, before I conclude, I'd like to thank a few people. Firstly, I'd like to thank the early seed grant, which was awarded to Dr. Ravi Rangarajan, with whom, with whom we collaborated. He walked us through every single step, to be honest, and he's been very supportive of us. He's also the senior lecturer at the Department of Public uh, Health in, for OHS in the University of Doha for Science and Technology. We'd like to thank Mr. Ahmed Adisi, who's the chair for the IELTS chapter, for giving us this opportunity tonight to actually present. Special thanks to Ms. Pauline, of course, who was a chair for the Department of Public Health and also our lead instructor for her continuous support. She's always been very supportive and she still has in our academic endeavors. And finally, we'd also like to thank the Office of Applied Research, Innovation and Economic Development at UDSC for the research support. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for attending and for giving us from your time. With that, I'd like to conclude our presentation. And if you do have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, both of you. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful section.
wonderful presentation, elaborate research done by both of you. And uh, we from Ayosh Qatar have no other uh, comments that, but to give you a round of applause for doing this research that not only benefits just, you know, just a few persons, but everyone coming into Qatar in view of this World Cup that is just around the corner. I've got a few questions for you from the audience. And uh, let's see if we, okay, I'll start with this. Uh, one of the questions goes like this. What is the impact of the carbon footprint in terms of FIFA 2022 per person and in general per person per annum? So you want the carbon footprint per person. So how much carbon dioxide will be produced by each individual coming in here, not the Absolutely. sum total? Well, Absolutely. we'd like to look, we have to research into that a bit because our scope was to look into the general uh, I, uh, amount of CO2 that we produce by this entire World Cup, not per individual. But as we further progress in our research, we'll be able to pinpoint exactly how much each individual will be able to produce. But as of now, though, we don't have the exact data to give you an answer, a numerical answer, but we will look into it and provide uh, further details as we progress down the research. That, that's, that, that's highly noted. Thanks for that. Now, uh, the Thank next you. question goes like this. Is carbon dioxide a function of population density and timing? Uh, is carbon dioxide a function of what? Population density and timing. Oh, you mean? Okay, I think what they're trying to say is if the level of carbon dioxide is co directly correlated with time, the amount of time as well as the population, yes, then it Absolutely. is. As what our as what our data shows, yes. If you if there is a higher population density factor, it is evident that the amount of CO two will increase given a period of time. Uh, for example, the zero point two nine uh, of high population density factor results in 9 ppm increase of CO2 per minute, not even an hour, per minute. So as we increase population density, there's a direct correlation with the amount of CO2 that would be recorded. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, the next question goes like this. The research yeah. for, the research, on, is it only for infrastructural works? What about other industries? Uh, what do you mean by infrastructure? I mean, are you talking about the world, the sporting events where we present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The absolutely. The infrastructural works for the 2022 World Cup. Someone, someone was asking, what about other industry? You, did you, did you uh, zoom your research into other industry rather than focus on infrastructural works? Well, uh, at this point, what we focus on were the co major contributors of CO2 emissions in terms of like the FIFA, for example, in Qatar, why we had the high levels is because of the, you know, uh, infrastructure here, because we didn't have stadiums like other sporting countries, right? Um, they had to build or construct seven new stadiums. And this is where most of the uh, emissions actually came from. And okay. in terms of, I, I, what's the second part of your question? Because no, if you can... the, the question was, I think the guy was more interested about knowing why your research was more uh, infrastructure related rather than looking at other industries like oil and gas and uh, utilities and uh, substations and something like that. I think this is, this is basically, but I think it also goes down to the fact that, yeah, the World Cup is just around the corner. We try to make sure that we, we get it right. So I think basically your, your, your answers are quite uh, correct. Right. Yeah. Thank now the next, the next question is, uh, please elaborate on the mitigation measures implemented considering the sources of CO2 generation in Qatar. Now, there's a sub question to that. What are the challenges? What were the challenges faced during the implementation of the CO2 mitigation strategies? Okay, this mitigation strategy is something we're proposing. I'd like to uh, elaborate on that. It's something we would like to propose. Uh, and the idea here is the limitations would be on every individual. Like as OHS professionals, it's human behavior that matters the most, isn't it? And it depends on every individual whether or not they would follow these mitigation strategies. I mean, Qatar as a country is doing quite a bit in terms of climate change. Yes, definitely. But are, is every single individual here going to follow these mitigation plans? That is something we can't guarantee. And, and, I can, and this is provided by, oh, in, in terms of OHS, where human behavior is almost the hardest thing to tackle in terms of control measures. It depends exactly whether or not an individual will take the initiative to follow along with these mitigation strategies. And Qatar already has a lot of mitigation strategies in place in order to control CO2 emissions. Excellent. 
Uh, yep. the, next, the next question is, does the considered introduction of plants and trees impact the measurement of CO2? And is it common for this to be considered alongside the well-being strategies that you have highlighted in your research? Um, can you repeat the question once again? Does the considered introduction of plants and trees impact the measurement of the CO2? And is this common? Or is this normal to be considered alongside the well-being strategies that you have in your research? Yeah, planting of trees and all definitely reduce the CO2 levels because um, there's a direct correlation with deforestation and CO2 levels. So if Qatar has pledged to uh, uh, plant more trees uh, because of the amount of CO2 that they've been, they've been emitting. So they've already started planting acres of acres of land with trees so that this will further reduce the amount of CO2 that's already been emitted and bring everything under control. Yes, definitely. The amount of CO plants that you have uh, will definitely have an effect on the CO2 levels in the environment. Okay. Uh, there's a further couple of questions. I think there are more questions, but I'll try to keep it uh, within the next two or three. Uh, you, you guys have done it, done a lot within the short uh, time. Uh, have you done any dispersion model exercise for CO2 as part of your research? Have you done discussions with uh... this dispersion? Dispersion. Uh, dispersion in terms of what? As model exercise for CO two as part of your research. Did you consider this as part of your research? Well, we're still in the first phase. We're still in the preliminary phase of our research, as I mentioned. So we're just collecting data at this point. It's phase two where we look into health impacts and what we can, what kind of health activities will help reduce CO two levels in the body. So we're still in phase one at this point. Okay, that, that's, that's well noted. Uh, what is the current level of CO2 in Qatar? And what is the projected level of CO2 after the World Cup? Well, the current level at this point will be about 440. When we were doing the baseline readings, uh, we used to come in here on Saturdays. It's quite a nice story. We actually spent quite a long, a lot of time on this research. We used to come here with Dr. Ravi. So we used to always get uh, baseline readings using our instrument. So uh, we, took the out the readings and currently the readings are always between 400 to 450. So 440 would be a good average at this point. Uh, the future is dependent uh, because as my colleague mentioned, um, population is increasing, the higher the demand. So for sure, there will be an increase. There will be yeah, a surge. 3 million tons of uh, CO2 is uh, expected to be, be released yeah. just during the World Cup. So mm -hmm. in the future, if they were, if they pledged, whatever they pledged on will come Considerably lower the amount of CO2, but yeah, there, there should be an increase depending on the increase in population. We infrastructure have. and uh, building, yeah, new stadiums and all. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for both of you uh, spending your time with us today and uh, pro uh, providing more uh, insight into the questions. Uh, CO2 emission and carbon footprint is a very topical issue. And uh, for you guys to have taken some time to do this research, especially since you are at the inception stage, this is highly appreciated. Whatever support you need from us, we would be happy to help. There are more, more questions that have come up, but I think more of them, we can uh, club them together. And uh, at the moment, I can only say uh, a good job, well done. Over, over now back to Venkat to, for the wrap-up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Valentine, for that uh, Q&A moderation. Well answered. And uh, I've seen a lot of appreciation uh, messages in the chat room. Thank you very much, Nashwa and Abdullah. That was a fantastic job that you have done and well presented. And uh, you have shared uh, your uh, acknowledgement to all the people. But we want to say thank, thank you, both of you. Okay, It was a pleasure to have you on board and uh, you know, presenting your uh, research work, what you have done. And it is a very, very valid uh, research and work. And it is going to you know give a lot of uh, uh, insights and uh, in terms of offsetting the CO2 emission in the during the FIFA World Cup and uh, fantastic job you guys are doing and thank you very much to Ms. Pauling for uh, you know uh, very much always in touch with the Ayush team and uh, making that you know supporting the Ayush meetings and all thank you very much Ms. Pauling and uh, both of you once again and all the attendees we have seen more than uh, around close to 120 people were attending this event at the peak and that's a, a great number. And thank you very much to all the members for uh, uh, attending this particular meeting. Hopefully in the next meeting, uh, communication you will get very shortly. Uh, next meeting would be, hopefully we'll be working on uh, in-person meeting. Let's uh, catch up in the next meeting in person if everything goes well.
with this once again i would like to convey my sincere thanks to everyone take care cheers and if possible can we take a group picture okay yeah can we all switch on your camera yeah thank you good Colin. Colin. yes thank you keep smiling i will take picture you don't know when i will be clicking thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you catherine for all your support thank you members for being here